welcome to the Turtis Pavlov Project. In this segment of the Turtis Pavlov Project, I'm going to talk about music and neuroscience. There's a tremendous amount of interest in uh, neural mechanisms that are involved in uh, playing, playing music, uh, uh, listening to music, and so on. And there's a lot of exciting work being done in this area. Uh, the most uh, provocative and uh, in, in some ways impressive uh, piece of information uh, concerned the fact that uh, it appears that expert musicians uh, have a different kind of brain anatomy than non-musicians or uh, non-experts. There are three major ways in which uh, the brains of uh, expert musicians differ from that of non-musicians. First, among string players, uh, expert musicians have greater cortical area devoted to uh, sensory motor control of the left hand. Uh, and that seems to be related, or that seems to make sense with uh, because for string players, the left hand has to do a lot of really specialized uh, things. With piano players, uh, the greater cortical representation of sensory motor areas appears to be associated with the right hand. So that's one of the uh, major ways in which the brains of musicians differ from non-musicians. The second uh, major finding is that musicians tend to have uh, greater cortical thickness. The thickness of the cortex is, uh, is larger in the case of musicians than non-musicians. And finally, uh, there is evidence that musicians have uh, a lot more uh, uh, neurons in the, uh, in the corpus callosum, which is the uh, portion of the brain that connects the left and right hemispheres. They have a larger corpus callosum. So people have been, have been really excited about these findings. And uh, there's a temptation to think that uh, musical practice somehow gives you a better brain. And uh, I want to talk about what kinds of inferences one can make from these sorts of data and what the significance of these sorts of data might be. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind is that uh, all of this evidence is correlational evidence. That is, you look at uh, uh, the brains of highly experienced musicians and non-musicians, and then you look, calculate a relationship, calculate a correlation. And as uh, students of introductory psychology are uh, repeatedly told, uh, correlation is not causation. Uh, and in the, the particular case of uh, these brain differences, among expert musicians, uh, you need to ask the question is whether these brain changes or brain differences uh, were produced by extensive musical practice or, uh, or whether they existed to begin with and it's the existence of these brain differences that perhaps encouraged some people to pursue a, a musical career. So, we, uh, so that's an important question to ask, and people have been starting to ask that question, and there's limited evidence that uh, these brain differences do not exist before uh, extensive musical practice is pursued. So that's helpful, but the most helpful uh, kind of evidence we need to be able to make a strong causal conclusion about musical activity and brain changes is, is, some, is to conduct an experiment in which you take a group of individuals uh, and, and randomly assign them to a group that is given musical training, a group that's not given musical training, and see how uh, differences develop uh, in the brains of these two groups of individuals. Now that's really hard to do. People are starting to do that kind of research, and there's some suggestive evidence. Uh, the ev uh, evidence is not very extent extensive, and uh, from what we know so far, you need at least two years of musical training in order to begin to see these 
kinds of differences. So we have a long way to go uh, in nailing down exactly how musical cha uh, training alters the brain. Uh, but it may very well turn out to be that uh, uh, the initial sus sus suspicions that uh, it's in fact musical training that increases cortical thickness and increases the size of the corpus callosum, that may in fact be a causally related to a musical training. Uh, would, what would be the significance of that? Well, if you're a neuroscientist and you're interested in how the brain becomes reorganized by experience, that's really important information. If you're a musician, I'm not sure what you do with that information. I suspect that one reason that uh, people are excited about this, and particularly musicians might be excited about these findings, is that uh, it tells them that there's something really fundamentally, profoundly important uh, that occurs in the nervous system as a, music, as a function of musical practice and musical activity. Well, I would like to suggest that if there's something really profound that happens, the, the, the most important outcome is not the change in the brain. Uh, it's the change in behavior. We don't interact with the world through what our brain looks like and the, how big our corpus callosum is. We interact with the world with each other through our behavior. Uh, so uh, the, the extent to which these changes are important we should really see them in behavior. And this becomes obvious if you consider uh, music contests. You enter a music contest like the uh, Van Cliburn competition in Fort Worth. Uh, if uh, these brain changes could be strongly related to behavior, then maybe what we should do is just submit our images of our brain. And based on that, we could pick who the best musician is. Well, that's kind of absurd. And the reason that's absurd is that we really don't have a clear understanding of how these brain changes uh, are related to performance. Uh, so, uh, and it's the performance that we're basically interested in. Uh, you, we wanna hear a beautiful rendition of a piece of music. And, and uh, our enjoyment is a function of that behavioral output. It's not a function of the brain. So we should really be focusing on behavior. But you might think, well, if I've got a bigger corpus callosum or thicker cortex, uh, I somehow have a better brain. And I suppose you can make arguments that you have a better brain but in what sense do you have a better brain? Uh, you can only claim that you have a better brain if you can, in fact, do more interesting things, if your brain is capable of more interesting behavior. So if you want to argue that uh, musical training, musical practice, creates a fundamentally improved brain that has consequences beyond the realm of musical performance, then I think the uh, onus of uh, proof has to be to show how behavior in, uh, in other realms or other aspects of behavior is somehow facilitated uh, by these brain changes. Uh, I, I think we tend to forget that uh, it's behavior is really the critical thing about learning, uh, acquiring skills and all of that sort of thing. And uh, the brain changes, uh, as prominent as they may be, they tell us about the nervous system, but they don't tell us a lot about how our behavior has improved and uh, how our behavior has uh, improved more generally than with respect to the specific skill that uh, uh, y y you've been practicing. So that's one issue that uh, you need to kind of keep in mind if you're thinking about these uh, um, neural changes that occur with musical practice. Uh, the other thing that's worth thinking about 
if you open that can of worms, if you argue that we should promote musical training because it creates fundamental changes in how the brain works, turns out virtually anything you do over, repeatedly over a period of time is going to create changes in the brain. I mean, physical activities do. There are studies of uh, people who, uh, experimental studies, where arbitrarily you take a group of subjects and you train them how to juggle. And another group of subjects doesn't get that training. Within three weeks, you can see, see significant changes in the brain. So if, if you're looking at brain cha changes as a consequence of musical practice as a way to justify uh, music training or getting heavily involved in music, uh, you open the door to arguments that, that equally support other forms of training and exercise. So uh, I think it's worth thinking about these issues when we uh, think about uh, questions about uh, the neuroscience of music. So uh, in this uh, particular episode, uh, uh, the opening music uh, was uh, the Allemande from the first of the cello suites. Uh, so I <clears throat> played a, a little opening segment of that. Uh, here is the rest of that piece if you're interested. Thank you. 